This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. He's Greg. I'm Nick. Thanks to Athletic Greens, your one-stop shopping for 75 high-quality vitamins to help you start your day right. Greg, before we get to this Bengals preview, let's get to the headlines that have happened over the last couple of days. Let's start with Mac Jones. Some people say he was limping. Some people say he was not limping. Some people are saying he was favoring something. Uh, What do you think is going on and what could it mean if he is limping slash favoring something? It's just a a typical New England media uh, observation off. (laughs) Uh, Was he limping? I don't think he was limping. I mean, I've even been through it where, you know, I've looked at a guy, been like, yeah, he's favoring something. Somebody else is like, I didn't think so. Um, you know, look, I, I don't know what Mac Jones was and wasn't doing in the locker room, but all I could tell you is this, he took some vicious shots at the end of that Raiders game. Um, there was one in particular where Chandler Jones came from behind and it looked like Mac got his, um, right foot sort of pinned under a little bit. Uh, so it would not be surprise me at all if he's dealing with something now he wasn't on the injury report. Um, That doesn't really mean much, especially because I think the Patriots can um, sort of take the injury report and I would do it the same way. So I'm not criticizing them that if there's zero percent chance that the guy's not going to play, then he doesn't need to be listed on the injury report. You don't have to, you know, list every single hangnail and things like that if it's not going to affect a player's status. Um, So. I think Mac is dealing with something. I don't think it's overly major. It's what is a week 16 now? Yes. Week 16. Everybody's yes. dealing with something. Uh, lengthy injury yep. reports for both teams. Uh, so uh, I don't think it's, it's not a huge deal, but it, am I reasonably certain that between the high ankle sprain earlier in the year with the left foot that he's dealing with something in the right foot? Yeah. But that's being a quarterback in the NFL. All right, something else that jumped out was how Bill Belichick handled the media talking about Mac yesterday. Uh, He was asked, I'm paraphrasing here, but he was asked if Mac was going to finish out the season as the starting quarterback the next three weeks. And Bill was noncommittal. He he deflected it. He went right to Cincinnati. He did his whole, you know, we're focusing on uh, Cincinnati kind of thing that Bill does. Uh, Just your, your thoughts about Belichick not necessarily committing to Mac Jones for the remainder of this season. Yeah, I, I I think it's a nothing burger. I think that that was Bill just um, not wanting to deal with it. I don't think he's ever really come out and, um, you know, there was the whole Mac Jones, uh, Cam Newton thing, um, you know, when he was struggling. And, of course, he was definitive about that. I mean, I just think it was – there. you just – there, there are different scenarios. I mean, in that year with COVID and Jared Stidham was his backup, who I know the Patriots had no confidence in. Uh, they also, you know, did they cut him or just trade him away to the Raiders? I think they traded him for next to nothing to the Raiders. And I think that, you know, considering Cam had signed for very little money, um, you know, it was a it was a tough situation overall with COVID. I think that, you know, and Bill realized where they were and uh, there was really no point in changing streams. So he just, you know, he did cam a solid and just was basically like, look, I put him in a tough situation in a variety of ways and I'm going to stick with him. And I think this is this is completely different. I think this is Bill just. Uh, he doesn't want to entertain the question, so he just tossed it away how he normally does. It was just like, yeah, we're just worried about winning against Cincinnati. Like, we're not talking about any jobs or anything up for grabs. And I think I think at the end of the day, he'll do what's best for the team. Um, you know, could that mean Max sitting at some point? I mean, I guess it could. I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more. But, you know, I don't think it's it, it's not in the plans right now or anything. Here's what I'll say. Um, you know, I don't necessarily disagree with with your take on it. And I know some people kind of tweeted at me yesterday after my reaction to it. My reaction initially was just, I won't blame Mac Jones if he asks to be traded this offseason. I, I would not blame him whatsoever if he requests a trade. I, I don't think it's going to happen. I would not be shocked if it happened. But I, I if I'm him, I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, We all know how they failed to give him the coaching staff that he needs. 
They failed to coach up the offensive line in enough time to protect him. The head coach has been asked multiple times, you know, whether or not Max is quarterback and for whatever reason, whether it's just bill being bill or something else, he has not necessarily committed to Mac in any way. He has not protected Mac in any way when he knows, I mean, he, he knew that Cam Newton was kind of screwed back in 2020. Well, Hey Bill, you screwed Mac Jones this year. So you might want to protect the young man every once in a while when you're asked about his future. And then you've got the whole Bailey zappy debacle that happened in that Monday night game when Mac shouldn't even been out there. Um, so, you know, if I'm Mac again, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but if this season ended, and there was a story that came out a week or two after the season was over saying Mac Jones wants out of new England. I would not blame Mac Jones. I would totally understand why Mac would request the trade and I would not be surprised by it. So I just think they they've handled this dude so badly and you know, the, the lack of, and I know it's kind of bill's way, but we're not talking about Tom Brady, the greatest of all time. You know, we're, mm-hmm. we're talking about a, a dude in his second season who's been really sabotaged by the coaching staff and how this has been put together and for Bill to just be non-committal doesn't help. It just fans the flames, and and I, Bill doesn't care about fanning the flames. But oh, oh, but maybe Mac does. You know, may, maybe Mac is tired of you know. Hey man, you gave me Matt Patricia and Joe Judge. Hey man, the offensive line sucks. Hey man, my wide receivers can't separate consistently. Hey man, you're playing Tyquan Thornton ninety percent of the snaps when he doesn't know the routes. Hey man, you played Bailey Zappi in that Chicago game and handled that awful. Hey man, you're not protecting me when people ask if I'm your quarterback of the future. Like. You, you, you accumulate all of that. And maybe he's like, yo, man, like, wh- wh- where's the love? Like, I know I haven't played great this year, but like you haven't put me in a position to succeed. And, and now people are asking you publicly and you're just kind of feeding the flames. I've got to deal with the Tom Brady stuff from three weeks ago, a month ago. I, I just wish people like, here's my one wish. My, my one wish is that this off season, they bring in an experienced offensive coordinator They bring in an experienced quarterbacks coach. They make sure that offensive line is fixed up and they let Mac Jones just play football without sabotaging him with the coaching staff, without the Brady stuff and all these other storylines and the zappy stuff. Just let the young man play football. That's what they did last year. And he was pretty good. He wasn't great, but he was pretty good. Um, Speaking of Mac, could he be benched at some point over the next three weeks, Greg? Uh, I think there's a slight possibility Um, in my mind, Nick, I think the only way that he sits down is um, it would have to be sort of a flame out situation where um, he's so sped up and, you know, basically the most important thing is he starts turning the ball over a lot again. Um, You know, you get in that sort of situation, let's say on Saturday when they play the Bengals, that the Bengals are getting home on pass rush. He's getting affected. He's out of sorts, maybe ranting and raving a little bit more. He's, he's turning the ball over and, and hurting the team. Then yeah, I could see a scenario, but in all likelihood. Um, and even though I, I do think, and we talked about it on Tuesday, I do think, I think th- that Belichick would have been warranted uh, to sit him at halftime against the Raiders just because of, you know, what went on at the goal line and how he was playing at that point. Um, right. I thought you could make the case for that. And but it, all things being equal. But the thing is, like you just talked about, all things are not equal. And I think that Bill Belichick realizes that, first of all, Max, not the only guy on offense who's frustrated with what's going on. I mean, you're talking about guys like David Andrews, Hunter Henry, Jacoby Myers, Kendrick Bourne, probably Trent Brown as well, um, you know, let alone a guy like Isaiah Wynn, who's now on injured reserve. But there's a lot of guys, Max, the public face of it. Um, and um, I don't think it's a good look at times, but I, I, I don't think his teammates mind all that much because he's giving voice to how most of them feel on offense. And if, and Bill, Bill realizes what he's done at this point. He realizes he screwed this up. He realizes that these guys are like Mac Jones is acting this way because of decisions that Belichick made. So if he decided to bench Mac for being frustrated for a situation that Bill created, how is that going to go over with the teammates on offense? And and I could tell you this, 
hundred percent that Mac Jones is universally beloved by his teammates, at least on that side of the ball. And they have his back on a lot of this stuff. So if Bill, if Bill decides that, you know, Mac's throwing a temper tantrum too much and that's why he's going to sit him, then I think he has the, the house could burn down on offense in the final three games. And I don't think Bill, <laughs> you know, with his future, not a hundred percent, um, secure i don't think bill wants that at all so i think i I think it's highly unlikely something else that uh bugged me a little bit yesterday was uh bertrand and zoe zoe and bertrand i know they talked about this on 98.5 and and zoe had mentioned like these next three games could be gigantic for max long-term future in new england i'm sorry man i am buying it like i'm not saying that zoe's not right i'm not saying his information is bad This might be three huge games for Mac. Here's my issue with that, though. Again, you 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 set him up to fail this year, and he's not completely blameless. Mac has not played as well as he should have played, but I don't think you can evaluate Mac this season because it's been a debacle around him. So I just don't think it's fair to say, okay, now after a season of an absolute bleep show on offense. This whole system being broken, the coaching being what it is, these three games are going to be the end-all, be-all for Max' future. Really? With, with a broken offense against three of the best teams in the AFC? So if he doesn't show out against Cincinnati, Miami, and Buffalo, he, he's not going to be starting in 2023? Like, that just – my concern, Greg, and I wanted to ask you about this. My, my concern is mm-hmm. Mac Jones is going to become a scapegoat for this coaching staff and Bill Belichick. And if he doesn't play well the final three weeks, the narrative that's going to be out there is, well, Mac just wasn't as good as we thought he was. It's not going to be about this coaching staff. It's not going to be about guys running the wrong routes and the spacing. And it's not just us, Dan Orlovsky, Kurt Warner, a lot of smart football people have watched this offense on film and say it's the worst offense in football. It's hideously coached. My concern is, they're setting up Mac to be a scapegoat. Is that a possible scenario that could play out? Um, yeah, I, I did hear what Zoe had to say. Um, yeah, I mean, I get. I, I think there are certain members of that staff that would like to make Mac Jones a scapegoat. Um, but I don't think that Bill Belichick does. I mean, you know, again, um, I, I do think that Bill now – and and I don't know when he came to this realization, but I think he now understands um, that he completely screwed this up. And I, I think that buys Mac Jones a lot of leeway. Um, I think, you know, to get back, I don't think I really answered uh, the point before about like, you know, would Mac be justified uh, demanding a trade? If, if Bill decides to roll this back, hell yeah. I mean, if that, that's what I would be doing if I were him, because, you know, look, it, if they're dead set on running whatever they want to run and they think they can get better with a Shanahan light system with another year and the same play callers and all that stuff, like great, wonderful, but that doesn't fit Mac Jones. It doesn't. And uh, he should definitely be asking a trade probably to Las Vegas to reunite with Josh McDaniels. But I, I don't, Nick, I agree with you hearing those Zoe comments and, and I love Zoe and he, he doesn't say those things uh, for no reason, but um, I, I just can't, I can't see that. I can't, I can't see Bill at the end of the day uh, indicting Mac Jones off of what happens in these last three games, especially, you know, very early on Saturday at some point, they might not be playing for very much in the final three games. So I mean, it's not like Mac Jones could do it all on his own, as we've seen this year. I mean, if you thought it was bad before, wait till they're just about eliminated if 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 things don't go their way on Saturday. I hope you're right. I hope he doesn't become the scapegoat. That'd be awful with the way they've handled him this year. Uh, Pro Bowl, Matthew Judon is the only Patriot that was uh, selected to the Pro Bowl. You have any issues with this, Greg? Uh, not really. Um, I know the, uh, the Patriots Twitter account, um, tweeted out some sort of picture about Matthew Slater not being named to the pro bowl. I mean, this is what happens when you, (laughs) when you slide into mediocrity. I mean, and plus the guy from the jets, I forget what his name is. 
that dude's really good. I mean, the Patriots even they they talked about him and, and he was a focal point and you know eliminated him and from the game plan. And so, I mean, you know, look, <laughs> everybody loves Slate and he's still really really good. And I know the Raiders um, had a game plan against him and uh, what's what's the dude's name? Day but no, what's the <laughs> School schooler. <laughs> I wanted to say Is Debo cooler? Sweeney. I, say I wanted to say Debo Sweeney or something. I don't know. Um, Dabo Sweeney. Yeah, Dabo <laughs> Sweeney for, for for some reason. Uh, but schooler. And the thing was, is like the Raiders. I went back and I looked at. It, I wrote my column on this about how the Patriots. You know, everyone's talking about the last play, but really, I mean, it, take that last play out of it. That game was a. Ended up being a close game. It was going to go to overtime. And if the Patriots eventually lost in like a regular game on like a field goal or something like that, they would have lost because the Raiders whooped their ass situationally on special teams. And that included Slater. There's three guys who weren't on the stat sheet that normally are. Matthew Judon had no stats. They took care of him. Uh, Matthew Slater had no special teams tackles. And um, Schooler had no special teams tackles. And the thing was, because Nick Folk was kicking off, and he can't reach the end zone. That would, there were actually special teams plays in that game, Nick. There were nine. The Raiders returned nine kicks in that game. That's like a half a season for most other teams. And yeah. the Raiders beat them. Then they also limited Marcus Jones. So I would say back to the question of the Pro Bowl. The only guys in my mind that really stood out this year that I think had a legitimate gripe. There's only really one guy, Michael Winu at right guard, and Quentin Nelson from the Colts. Got that spot, uh, you know. It, it, look, that that guy's he, that guy's really good. Awena was really good this year, um, but I, I don't have a I don't have a huge gripe. Yeah, neither do I. Look, you you haven't been a very good football team. The Pro Bowl sucks anyway. They're changing it this year to like flag football. Nobody cares about the game. Um, I, I know. I'm sure some of the guys care about being named Pro Bowlers, but. I'm not going to stand on the mountaintop for a seven and seven team that's played inconsistent. Uh, the, the playoff situation, Greg, looking at how this all lays out um, kind of, kind of an interesting scenario. I mean, obviously you're bunched up at the, at the bottom of the AFC last week was very difficult for the Patriots, not only because of the nature of the loss, but also because of who else won last weekend. Um, you know, namely the chargers winning uh, hurt you. Uh, in your, in your playoff hunt. And now you're sitting at seven and seven. So how it lays out is the, the Ravens right now are the fifth seed at nine and five, the chargers and the dolphins are both eight and six. They're at the six and seven seed respectively. The Patriots own the head to head tie break, obviously with the jets. So then the Patriots, there are seven and seven. So the Patriots still have an absolute shot at making the playoffs. Of course, they still play the dolphins, one of these final three games, just kind of lay out the playoff situation for this team, Greg, and how you feel. Well, I think the, the most likely scenario for them that, and I, the way they're playing and that they've only beaten one starting quarterback this year. Um, and unless uh, Burrow Tua and Josh Allen, or, you know, maybe the bills clinch something where they don't need to play even though they normally play at least like a half. They're not like the Chiefs where they just sit everybody. Um, you know, even if they lose this weekend, if they win out against Miami and Buffalo, which is possible, uh, especially if the Bills have nothing to play for in that final game, then they have a decent chance. But, you know, they're going to have to root against the Jets and the Chargers and and, you know, probably the Dolphins to have a chance. But, you know, I just think, where they are right now as a football team, I, I think it's just utterly ridiculous to really talk about much with the playoffs until, you know, the Patriots like beat a good team and we'll see what happens on, on Saturday against the Bengals. And I do think, you know, the weather looking at the weather today, I think it's supposed to be like a wind chill of like 15 and the wind's supposed to be up. So in most circumstances, you would think that would help the Patriots, but I don't know about that week, but we'll talk about the specifics of that game in a little bit. Yeah, before we get to the uh, Bengals preview, let's get to Athletic Greens. Absolutely. I started taking AG1 because I wanted to make sure I was getting all the vitamins and nutritional supplements I needed in one place. Now I've been on it for six months and I love it. It doesn't taste like it's super healthy. 
kind of has a mild tropical, little minty taste, and I actually look forward to it each morning. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, all the things you're looking for. I take it first thing in the morning. It's now part of my routine, and I'd be lost without it. I love how it contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, while still tasting good. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is huge during the winter months up here in New England, and five free travel packs for your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash bedard. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Bedard to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, so Cincinnati comes to town. They get off to a tough start this year. Burrow was inconsistent at the very beginning of the season, but, man, have they figured it out. Found a rhythm. They've won six games in a row. They're 10-4 and on the season. Uh, They have the third-best point differential in the AFC behind Buffalo and Kansas City. Of course, they beat Kansas City head-to-head, so you could argue that Cincinnati is at least the second-best team in the AFC uh, mm-hmm. between, you know, it's between them and Buffalo. It's rather obvious that Buffalo, Cincinnati, and Kansas City have separated from the field. Of course, we know they made it to the uh, Super Bowl last year and almost won the whole damn thing. Uh, Joe Burrow, Mac Jones, Greg, when you look at these two young quarterbacks – What goes through your mind? Um, A couple of things. Um, I would say the first thing, and I, and I think, I think people sort of discount it and, and don't really consider it all that much. And, and even I have at times when it comes to Mac Jones is, you know, when I, when I watch Burrow and, and I watch Mac Jones, you know, with Burrow, I think they're, I do think they're very similar skill set wise. Um, in terms of overall athletic ability, arm strength, I'll say Burrow probably has a little bit of a better arm. Uh, it's not huge, a little bit of a quicker release. Um, but when you watch Burrow, and it's very similar to Tom Brady. I mean, just those were the comparisons coming out. And I I think they're pretty apt to this point that, that Burrow is just one of those guys who just, he has the intangibles. Like he just... He, he has yeah. the, the clutch gene. He has whatever Brady has to make him better than his athletic ability. Burrow has the same sort of stuff. Is it going to be Brady? Probably not. But he's the, he's the closest to Brady that, that I've seen. Um, the other thing that stands out when you watch Burrow compared to Mac Jones, and this is what I mean where I've even discounted it, is that Burrow's played a decent amount of football. Um, people have to remember Mac Jones only started really one season at Alabama. Now Burrow started two at LSU. It's yep. not a, you know, it's not like he started four years or something like that, but still that's significant. Um, and Mac Jones. So he's really started just two years since high school where, you know, Joe Burrow has now started. This is his, he got hurt his, his uh, rookie year, but this is his third year in the NFL. He started two years in the in, in college. That's a significant amount of time. And like, you know, that's a significant amount of, hey, I've seen this before. I've been in this situation. I know how to deal with it. That kind of stuff where I just think Mac doesn't have that that baseline that Burrow has in terms of playing experience. And I think I think it matters. And I don't think I don't think enough people take that into consideration. Of course, we live in the age where people just expect guys to be like great like this, like they get this instant reaction. (laughs) I mean, you know, just like, you know, I I look at Trevor Lawrence. I mean, you look at Trevor, whenever anybody wants to criticize Mac Jones about what he's become in year two and how he struggled. And even if they want to poke holes in him about his rookie season or the end of that, which I just think is um, ridiculous considering the team itself went down the tubes in the second half of the season um, as has become their norm um, since even Tom Brady's last season. Um, You know, I look at Trevor Lawrence. 
Look at Trevor Lawrence in his rookie season with Urban Meyer and a terrible coaching situation. He was obviously getting no no instruction how to play quarterback in the NFL, let alone a real deal offensive system. The coach is getting fired in the middle of it. Like basically what happened to Trevor Lawrence as a rookie. Now all of a sudden, now everybody's like pants on fire about Trevor Lawrence, which they should because he's good. And you know why he's much better? They got him a real coach. Like, just look at the night and day difference between Trevor Lawrence. And then you look at Mac Jones, who was good, solid as a rookie. Now he's not as good. It's because of coaching and what's around him. And so that leads me to my other point about Burrow when I watch him. The structure around him from, you know, he came into a system where Zach Taylor, I think, yes, Zach Taylor was the, he, Zach Taylor became coach in 2019. He had Andy Dalton. That was Dalton's first year. Then they drafted Burrow in 2020. So he's had Zach Taylor, who's an offensive guy, from the Um, get-go. You watch, and I'll let you give your thoughts on Burrow, but I want to get in a little bit more about and try to explain, because I think this is more a podcast conversation than me writing it in terms of, you know, when we talk about confidence and we've talked about it this year about Mac, when you watch him, you're like, he doesn't have, he doesn't have confidence in the offensive line. He doesn't have confidence in the routes. He doesn't have confidence in what he's going to see. And it's the polar opposite with Joe Burrow. And I think that's the key to his success. But, you know, first I want to get your thoughts on Burrow because you've probably seen him a lot more than I have. I've just watched a couple of games on film. I haven't watched him throughout his career. I love him. I love him. He's uh, I love them at LSU. I, 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 I've loved him since he came into the league. I think he is confident. He's got swag. He's a leader. He's fearless. He is accurate with the football. Um, he doesn't play it safe. He's willing to trust mm-hmm. his guys in certain spots. Uh, he, he does a good job of taking care of the football. I mean, this season, to give you an example, he has 10 interceptions this year, but four of those came in the first weekend of the season against the Steelers defense. So this is a guy who's only thrown six interceptions, you know, in 13 games, he takes care of the football. Um, he has been able to manage massage, uh, manipulate the, the pocket with an offensive line his first year, which was abominable, which got him hurt. And then they weren't much better last year. I mean, that offensive line was literally one of the worst offensive lines in football last season. And he took them to the Super Bowl, and they had a legitimate chance of winning that game against the Rams. Uh, I, I think he's a heady player. Um, I, I think he, you know, quote unquote, gets it. He's great with the media. I just, I, I think he's one of those guys that you mentioned the whole Brady thing. And I'm not going to say he's Brady, obviously, but uh, he does have that kind of cool, calm, collective swag confidence about him where, you know, guys just seem to love to play with him and for him. And I, I would also say like, like you were kind of hinting at, he's got the support system. The offensive line has been sketchy. Uh, they mm-hmm. did make moves this year to try to address that in the off season. The offensive line is better now than it was at the beginning of the season. I still don't think it's great, but yeah. you know, you look at Jamar chase, you know, the, his guy from LSU, they, they, they decided to pick him instead of Sewell at the top of the draft a couple of years ago. And, and he's got Higgins, he's got Boyd, he's got a lot of weapons. He's got Joe Mixon in the backfield. So this is a guy that has been given, you know, legitimate upper echelon weapons around him with an offensive mind as the head coach who's been with him from day one, taking care of him. It is a completely different scenario than what Mac is facing this season. Uh, but I, I overall love Joe Burrow. I'm, I'm a big fan of Burrow. And I think he's, you know, going to be one of the best quarterbacks in this league for, for some time. Mm-hmm. I, I completely agree with you on, on all of that. And, and, you know, what I want people to understand, and I hope, I hope this makes sense because it it sort of does in my head, but we'll see if it comes out of my mouth and makes sense. But, you know, I I just think, and this is why I push push back on a lot of Mac Jones criticism and to to the point where I'm not saying he's anything like, I think he's a franchise quarterback. I don't know. I I don't. And and nobody could say that. I I don't think with any conviction, including his own team, but I, I just think you can't, you can't judge him on what's going on around him. And, and this is what I mean. Cause I watched the watching the Bengals on film and 
you know, I, it, and it sort of reminds me of Brady at times where it was like, all right, Brady was basically like, look, if I'm not going to have a good offensive line, at least give me good weapons and let's spread it out and let me figure things out. And that's what the Bengals do a lot of the time because you're right. Their offensive line is not very good. Um, the kid, I don't know who they used to have there, um, but at left guard, they have this kid, Cordell Volson, who's a fourth round pick rookie. Um, and he's starting where Cole Strange is starting and he's he's not very good at all and Lael Collins who used to be good back in the day with Dallas is freaking yeah. terrible at right tackle he's awful <laughs> um, I like I like Jonah Williams at left tackle Ted Karras is Ted Karras I mean he's rock solid average Joe center guard whatever he's playing out of position he's really a guard he's not a center and, you know, Kappa is okay at right guard, the guy that they got from the Bucks, but they don't have a great offensive line, but because they have enough decent weapons that they can just put Joe in shotgun empty and a lot like Brady at times in his career, Brady would just read the defense and boom, 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 we're going to move the ball. And so when I talk about confidence and I talk about how Mac Jones has lacked confidence and, and people – People look at him, they're like, well, he's jittery. He's this, he's that. That's because he doesn't trust anything as the quarterback. Like, you know, Joe Burrow, at least when he gets up there, he knows, all right, I got to worry about left guard or I got to worry about right tackle. You know, I know where my weak spots are. With, with, with Matt Jones's protection, like any place on the line outside of right guard and center when Andrews is out there has a chance to just completely implode. And he could be trampled at any point in time, you know, like Chandler Jones hurting him in the, in the Las Vegas game where Trent Brown just whiffed on a tackle. Cole Strange just whiffs on things, right? Tackle. They just whiff on things. And so as a quarterback, like you just want, you, you want to at least know where your weaknesses are so that you can, you can make decisions off of that and you can have a clock in your head. And then there's also the whole route thing. And that's a big thing. And when you watch the Bengals, because Zach Taylor schemes it exactly right. Like I can't tell you how many times you see little five yard routes and you'll see with the Bengals, they're there. They are an actual offense. Well, you'll see three of the guys <laughs> out for routes turn around in, you know, within two steps of the drop. Then you'll have another guy where if Joe ha Phoenix, he has a little bit more protection, then maybe I go to the second level. Then if Joe feels okay, uh, I, I have time here where I can hitch a little bit more. Now I got Jamar Chase going down the sideline or T Higgins or something, a, a deep route. Like you look at it and you're like, there are options there all the time. And so Joe knows he can be decisive. He can get rid of it in 0.5 seconds where Matt Jones between the protection and also the routes, he has no flipping idea what he's going to see every single time he drops back to pass and, and yep. you can't play quarterback that way in the league. And I would just people who go to the game on Sunday and are freezing their ass off. God bless you. Or people who are watching it at home. If they have decent angles, watch the route coordination, the spacing, the timing on what's available like that to Joe Burrow. And then you wonder, then compare what's going on with Mac Jones. And the, the, the answer to why Mac is struggling and why others aren't should be right there for you to see on, on Saturday. The vast majority of people listening to this podcast uh, have not played, you know, pro sports, probably all of them. Maybe there's a couple of them that listen. And to those, thank you for listening. We appreciate you, all of you. But even if you're in an everyday job, right? Like my job, I want to know what to expect. I find comfort in knowing what to expect. Consistency, um, you know, consistency from my hosts, consistency from the digital team, consistency, consistency from my for Bedard getting this podcast off the, uh, getting him a script and actually scheduling a podcast every week. <laughs> Doesn't always go perfect with that part, but like when when you when you look at it. Like that's what people like, yes, you, you need, you need to know what you're dealing with to, to do the best job that you can. And if you're in a situation, no matter what your career is, that's messy around you, that you don't really know what to expect from your coworkers or your bosses and, and people are, are doing jobs that they shouldn't be doing. And people are doing the same jobs, you know, that, that they should be, you know, not be sharing. They should be doing like you, 
you, you have guys running into not each other, but the same spaces for routes, you know, it's, it's like that stuff is fundamental. It's rudimentary in, in any walk of life. I think this is very relatable in any walk of life in any career that you have, you want to be able to trust what's around you. You want to be able to trust upper management. You would like to be able to trust some of your coworkers, especially if you work in a field that involves working together on projects, for example, like you need that cohesion one of Tommy Heinsohn's, God bless, one of his favorite words. You need that cohesion to, to make things work. And, and when you don't have that, the, the lack of trust, the lack of confidence, even for somebody who is super confident, over time, that confidence is going to be chiseled away. And I think what you're seeing now is, is Mac Jones, who just doesn't trust anything around him, doesn't believe in anything around him, doesn't know what to expect from snap to snap, doesn't doesn't really think much of the offensive coordinator like any of us do or the play caller. And he sees this for what it is. And so does the rest of the offense. So I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think, and this is not to bail out Mac Jones. It's not mm-hmm. to say that he is going to be franchise QB one for 15 years, but if we're, if we're doing an honest assessment and being completely objective about how to evaluate Mac this year, if you're being objective I don't think you can evaluate him this year because the system around him has been so broken. The only way you can evaluate somebody is if they have a chance. And I just feel like Mac has not had much of a chance to succeed this year. And yeah, it, it's I, not, yeah. not on him. And Nick, I just wanted to add, you know, cause I, we agree on this, but you know, it, just as you were talking, like it, it, it was entering my mind, like, you know, Obviously, people around here and, and us in general were spoiled by 20 years of watching the best ever to do it and how yep. he made it look easy at times. I think people forget or it, it doesn't really occur to them how difficult playing NFL quarterback is. I mean, when you have from first of all, you know, forget all the pre-snap stuff and, you know, what's the play going to be and things like that. But then you got to like between. Basically, you have about two seconds um, once you get the ball to, you know, not only figure out where you're going to go with the ball and what the defense is going to do, but also, you know, what kind of rush is coming at you and how do I feel that? And like, that's why, like, when you talk about precision, like you need precision. It's why Tom Brady, like, would, you know, basically alienate certain receivers because like as a quarterback, like he needs to depend on he needs to know. If we get this look, you're going to be there because I'm going to deliver the ball. And if you don't, you're going to make me look like an idiot. And and that's why, like, trust, the Brady trust tree and all that stuff, like, was so important and talked about around here because it was a real thing. And, you know, Mac doesn't trust anything. He doesn't trust that it's going to be a good play call. He doesn't trust that it's going to get blocked. And, like, you know, Ty, even even guys like Jacoby Myers aren't running their routes properly anymore, to, let alone Tyquan Thornton is just running all over the place, like doing whatever <laughs> the hell he wants. And, like, it's it's impossible to play quarterback like that. And it's not to excuse Mac because he could have been better at times, and he's misplays. John U. Smith. Yes. Jacoby Myers, like he's yeah. got to hit those no matter what. Those wide open plays, he's got to hit them. But to play good quarterback in the NFL, everything has to work. You need that cohesion or else it looks like a mess, which is where the Patriots are right now. Uh, it's before what, we get, it's what it. Joe Burrow doesn't have to deal with. It's not a mess because he has a coach, he has real weapons, and they're impressive. Uh, all right, quickly, because we've run long here. Uh, shocker. Bengals defense, a couple of quick, a couple of quick highlights, Greg. Uh, I, I love the defensive coordinator, uh, Lou Anaromo. He does an excellent job. He, uh, they, they are an excellent second half defense. They make a, he, he is the master at adjustments. So um, good luck. If the Patriots don't get off to a good start in this game, I think that uh, they're going to get a bit of a break because Sam Hubbard, who is one of their next to Trey Hendrickson, who is dealing with a wrist thing, Trey Hendrickson, who's, incredible at defensive end sam hubbard is their second best um defensive end uh leads the team in sacks he is going to be out um for a while they're hoping to get him back by the playoffs or at least in a couple weeks um so we'll have to see it looks like joseph osai will sort of fill in there but they have a deep 
a deep rotation on the defensive line. They get after it. They're meaty. This is a bad matchup for Cole Strange and anybody else who is struggling on that offensive line. I, you know, DJ Reader is one of the best nose tackle defensive interior guys, um, but they also have guys that they just rotate in who are really good. So that's their 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 linebackers are excellent. Logan Wilson, Jermaine Pratt. Uh, they're really good. The secondary is a ex- bunch of experienced guys. They mix things up. Not a whole lot of busts in that secondary. Uh, good safeties. It's a. It's going to be a tough chore for this Patriots offense, and um, you know it's <laughs> it's going to be interesting this one. A tough chore for the Patriots offense. How many times have we said that this year? Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Let's look at the uh, pick situation here. So uh, I am 12 and two against the spread. I believe Bedard is 11 and three uh, against right. the spread. We've got the Bengals minus three. Again, this game is on Saturday for Christmas Eve. Um, so the Bengals minus three, the over under is 41 and a half. Greg, how you feel? Uh, you know, I think, I think the Patriots are getting the Bengals at a good time. I think, you know, they just had the, the Bucks game and I think they have the Ravens next week, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but anyways, they have a tough game the next week. So this is a sort of a good spot, a look ahead spot, but, uh, and I and I do think that the I think that the Patriots pass rush what they do with their little stunts and twists, especially with Juwan Bentley, who got a lot of pressure this past week against the Raiders. Um, I think they'll have success, especially going at that left guard uh, Volson. Uh, I assume Teddy Karras is going to have those guys repped up. He's going to be telling Burrow exactly what the Patriots are going to want to do because it's the same stuff they've been doing for a couple years. I don't know whether the Bengals can block at all. Uh, the Bengals will have some really bad plays as well. They Zach Taylor, even though they have a slow ass offensive line, loves to run these little tosses and and stuff to the edges with the running backs. I, they have they have really good running backs with Mixon and Perrine, and you know they get a bunch of guys going. Um, I just think at the end of the day, I, this is the type of offense with a good quarterback. They can spread the Patriots out with multiple weapons that he can throw to plus the running game. Like it's you can't key on any one thing in this game and you can't you can't do what you did to Devontae Adams last week because the 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 Bengals have better weapons, secondary weapons than the Raiders did. And so. I think this is a tough chore for the Patriots. I even think the Bengals are good. They're good on the road. They're hot. They're good in cold weather because they can run the ball. They can do whatever they need to do. Uh, As long as Joe Burrow doesn't completely take the game off and just, I I, I don't think the Patriots stand much of a chance in this game. I think the Bengals uh, win somewhere around by 10, somewhere around there. You know, I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised. And all, it's always, you know, dependent on turnovers. That's the one unpredictable thing. I wouldn't be surprised if this game is a little bit closer than some anticipate this game to be. I think like from a national level, a lot of people think that the Bengals just easily steamroll the Patriots. And look, that might end up happening again. A couple turnovers. You play like crap. You have penalties. It, it could get out of hand. But when you look at Cincinnati, they've not been able to run the football effectively um, you know, at least consistently this year, they're, they're actually one of the the worst ranked run offenses in, in all of football. And so they're, they're pretty one dimensional um, for most of the time. And, and I think the Patriots can make them one dimensional in this game, as, as Greg said, is going to be mostly on burrow. I believe here's the problem. The secondary for the Patriots is very banged up. I would not think that Jalen Mills is going to be out there. Um, Jack Jones has been banged up. Does he play? If he plays, what's he look like? And then you've got, you know, Jonathan Jones, which we discussed earlier in the week, he's been struggling. So with all of these weapons, I I think Burrow's going to be able to have a good day Uh, unless as Greg said, he he completely craps himself, which I don't see happening. The other issue is um, Cincinnati's red zone defense has been the 10th best in the NFL. And we know the Patriots red zone offense has been the worst in the NFL. So even if you move the ball against this Bengals defense, which is going to be difficult, I don't know how in the world you can score with Matt Patricia as your play caller and with this red zone defense being as good as it's been. So I just don't think the Patriots have enough offense. I don't think they'll be able to score or, you know, six instead of three, if they get into the red zone, I like the Bengals as well. Again, I do think the Patriots defense could have some success if they don't 
you know, get beat deep by Jamar Chase a couple of times and, and you know, mind their P's and Q's and not blow coverage. But I do think the Bengals win this one. Uh, you know, it could be anywhere from six points to really 14 points. It just depends on, you know, how Burrow plays and if the Patriots kind of just go, okay, we, we see the writing on the wall. Uh, we remind you all, BSJ, BostonSportsJournal.com. Uh, you can always check them out. They have great coverage of all the teams. I know John Corrales writing about the Celtics uh, earlier today. I was looking at that. Um, and you can get a gift subscription right now uh, at BSJ. It's thirty nine ninety nine for the annual plan. It is it is great coverage. If you're trying to figure out a last minute, last second gift idea, this would be a great one. And also, uh, don't forget that if you are a member at BSJ, you can get a discount on those as well. So uh, check out BostonSportsJournal.com for the uh, for the gift subscriptions. As we're just a couple of days away from uh, Christmas. With that in mind, Merry Christmas to all of you. Do not let the Bengals Patriots game ruin your holiday. If it goes badly, um, it might, it might get you sauced a little bit earlier than you want to on, on Christmas Eve, but enjoy the holiday, Greg. I enjoy this podcast so much. I wish you a Merry Christmas. I'm sure I'll send you a text over the weekend, but um, I love working with you and hopefully you and the family have a great holiday, my man. You and Kelly as well. And happy Hanukkah to our Jewish friends and everybody else celebrating, uh, other holidays this time of year but yeah thanks for everybody for supporting the pod and bsj nick and i have a lot of fun uh doing this uh it keeps us connected even though he's three thousand miles away hopefully it keeps him (laughs) a little bit more connected to home um and uh probably good that he has a buffer zone because he uh if he had to listen to sports talk radio around here all the time he would probably uh, combust but uh, you know, we love them. <laughs> we miss them. But at least we get to stay connected some way. So Merry Christmas, buddy. Damn right. Uh, he's Greg. I'm Nick. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy your holidays. We'll be back early next week to uh, review this lovely, hopefully, lovely Bengals Patriots game. <laughs>